Hi, thank you for that introduction. I'm delighted to be here to share my research and some of the other things that I do with my free time um, with everybody here. So um, with that, I'll jump right into my talk. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work I've been doing as a postdoctoral research fellow on invasive species management. But before I get into that, just a little bit of background on me. So I'm originally a desert rat from Albuquerque, New Mexico, so I'm currently seated in Edmonton, Alberta. So if you just go south straight down the Rockies, you can get to my house. Um, I think part of the reason why I'm so interested in marine biology now is because I grew up in kind of an absence, an abscess of absence of water. And so ever since um, high school, I basically have strived to live as close to a marine ecosystem as I can. Um, for college, I decided to go to school in California where I basically was in the water in every way, shape or form. And so I spent a lot of time kayaking in Monterey Bay, looking at otters. Uh, I played water polo through quite a few years as a beach lifeguard. So spending as much time in the ecosystem as I could. Uh, my original degree um, at Cal State Monterey Bay was an English degree um, geared towards being an English teacher, but because I was in such a beautiful ecosystem, I thought, what a waste. I'm going to go back to school and get a marine biology degree. That led me to work in um, the California Seafloor Mapping Lab, and the project that I worked on here was really, really large scale, incredibly applied, which was really fun. Um, I was part of a lab that was using uh, sonar technologies to map the entire continental shelf of California, which is over 1,200 kilometers, and uh, create maps that were used to create MPAs or marine protected area um, locations. And I specifically spent a lot of time classifying um, different types of sand, um, specifically called rippled scar depressions. And so my introduction into science was a lot of um, more marine geology and geomorphology type things, and not a lot to do with the organisms that lived there. However, again, being in Monterey Bay, California, there's a lot of really great opportunities. And so I was able to do a lot of scientific diving and get a lot of dive certifications. And that basically solidified it for me. I loved the work I did as kind of a broad scale um, marine ecologist, but I also loved being in the water and I really like counting fish. And so um, through some of the programs that I was in as an undergrad, I was able to do a lot of diving. I was able to go to Florida and do some warm water diving, and that really did it for me. The Monterey Bay is beautiful, but as you can see um, on that top left picture, I'm wearing a lot of neoprene, um, and it takes a lot of weight to keep me down, and so I found the, the warmer waters were a little bit easier for me to maneuver. For my PhD, I went to uh, Corvallis, or Oregon at Oregon State University and worked with Mark Hickson in his lab. Um, he's a coral reef ecologist who's done a lot of work in the Bahamas and um, was one of the people who was basically on the ground when the lionfish invasion happened on his sites. And so I did, um, this was kind of my introduction into invasive species ecology and um, understanding how invasive species can change the, change the environments that they're in. And so all my PhD work was done in the Bahamas, looking at how lionfish interact with their habitat, kind of drawing on what I did as an undergrad, but also looking at species interactions with um, native uh, species there. It's also where I met my current PI, Dr. Steph Green. And so after I graduated um, with my uh, PhD, she invited me to come work with her in her lab here at University of Alberta. So at the Change Lab, um, we do a lot of work kind of creating tools and building capacity for lots of conservation management. And so what I get to do is think about invasive species removal plans, conservation outcomes, and specifically how to build tools so that people besides me can implement the science that I use in order to create effective management plans. So getting into why invasive species. So invasive species are a global problem. They're found in virtually every ecosystem um, you can find on the planet, including polar regions, deserts, and the deep seas. And this is just a picture of a collection of, of the variety of different types of invasive species that you can encounter. 
Marine invasive species can be an especially daunting problem because of the open nature of our oceans and waterways. So this makes management of them inherently more difficult and total eradication of the species once they're invaded, highly unlikely. So in a paper by Green and Grossholtz, they did a survey of marine invasive species managers and practitioners. And 80% of these uh, managers found that they were managing an invasion that was occurring beyond their resources for eradication. However, 95% of them found that they lacked um, density and removal targets that would allow for ecological recovery of the system that they were managing. And so there's a big disconnect with like the knowledge that you know you cannot completely remove an invasive species and the available resources you have in order to manage that properly. So a lot of the basis for the work I do is thinking instead of um, what we think of traditionally as kind of numerical eradication, how many of these invasive species can remove. And now we're starting to think about functional eradication. And that's um, the premise behind that is thinking about how to set ecological targets for your um, invasive species removal so that you can still manage the system in the way you want it to work. And so that may mean leaving um, certain areas with the species or trying to remove it all areas and leaving a very low density. So the two species I've been focusing on for my district or for my postdoctoral work are the Pacific lionfish, which is invasive in the Bahamas, Florida, and the Caribbean. And it's actually spreading down to a lot of areas in South America and the Gulf of Mexico as well. The other species that I concentrate on is the European green crab, and my study area for that is the Salish Sea and the Canadian West Coast. And as you guys are on the East Coast, you may have, uh, this is one that you're really familiar with because it's been there quite a lot longer than it has on the West Coast of um, the continent. So one of the great things about these species, and if we can call them great for my particular study questions, is that both of these have been found that they have densities that are too high for eradication. And a lot of the places they're there, they're there to stay. There's not gonna be any way to get rid of them completely. But both of these species have also been shown that reduction of their densities can limit their impacts both ecologically and economically. So they're really great for the framework that I want to um, work with. So I always think about managing these species towards functional eradication with three different components. The first is to identify, um, identify things about your species, and this can include where your invader is found and what types of negative effects that they're going to have on their native community. And this is really where a lot of invasive species work lies. So for both lionfish and green crab, there's a lot of work on where you're going to find them, what densities you'll find them in, what, what other species they're eating, how they're affecting the habitat, things like that. So there is quite a bit of work done there. So that's great. Both of my species have a lot of background information I can draw from. Then the next step is to target these densities for suppression. And so this um, goes a little bit more in depth in understanding, OK, how many fit, how many lionfish can we have on a reef before we start seeing reduction in the fish that we care about? How many green crab can we, uh, how many green crab do we have to remove before we stop seeing this effect on seagrass beds, things like that? And again, there has been, especially for lionfish, there's quite a lot of work done in this um, area, and they've started to do work on this for green crab. Again, there's a green and Grossholtz paper that just came out that um, examines these types of thresholds that you can get to to reduce these invasive species impacts. So where my work is really focused on is how do you prioritize knowing that you can never remove every single invader from your system how do you um, how do you pick where to remove and how do you pick how many to remove and so the key things going behind that are just identifying your limitations and this includes how much time do i have money do i need a lot of people what type of gear do i need and then also looking at a subset of priority um, locations based on what people value. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to kind of go through two case studies of some work that I'm doing. One focused on lionfish, where we're looking at the limitations for removal, and then one looking at green crab and understanding how um, what people value can help us um, prioritize locations for removal and monitoring. So the study that um, focuses on lionfish is uh, in three different regions. And so this is a map of the Atlantic Ocean. 
Um, and this was a huge collaborative effort where folks from four different jurisdictions came together, came up with a set of protocols on how to remove lionfish and um, collected a ton of data on what this looked like. And so, oops, I thought I had, so tons of collaborators. And I kind of came in at the end after the study had been um, put together and I was in charge of doing all the analyses and putting everything together, which was really fun. But because of the nature of lionfish removals, we're able to collect a really high resolution of data, which is great. So the things that we can collect data on that potentially could limit um, removal efficiency are aspects related to the invader. So if you don't know anything about lionfish, these fish usually are um, always removed by hand. There are some studies that are doing to try and find traps that are a little bit more efficient in deep depths, but lionfish typically you go out and you can remove them each individually by hand. So that lets us pick up a lot of information about every individual that's removed. So we can get information on what size they are, the densities on the reef, what type of behavior they're exhibiting, are they swimming, are they resting on the reef, and then where are they on the reef? Are they floating in the water column or are they sitting down on top of a coral head? We can also get a lot of information about the habitat, and this is again, where exactly is a lionfish on a reef? Um, is it in the sand? How far is this uh, reef from shore? How long is it going to take you to boat up to get there? Can you swim out there? How deep is it? Is that going to limit the amount of time that you can spend underwater? And then also thinking about things like complexity and habitat composition, because these are really important for reef fish distributions. Is there a lot of vertical relief in really rugose areas? Is it a flat seagrass bed? Things like that. We can also get really detailed information on um, the exact removal. So how much time did it take to remove each lionfish? Did you use a spear? Did you use a hand net? Um, and it, information on the individual. How many dives have you done? Is this the first time you've ever removed lionfish? Are you very experienced? Things like that. Do you work for a organization or are you a volunteer? All of these things can lead to uh, more or less efficiency on the reef. The last kind of um, group of uh, variables that we looked at were the environment. And so lionfish um, have been shown to be uh, crepuscular, so more active at dawn and dusk. They tend to be more sedentary during the day. Um, so things like cloud cover can have an effect if it's a um, maybe uh, mimicking darkness or mimicking the dusk. If you've done any sort of swimming or scuba diving, you know that currents and tides can be very, very uh, detrimental to how well you can move underwater. And then time of day is also another important one, again, for that um, uh, crepuscular effect when lionfish tend to come out and be more active. So we did a few different types of things for this study, but the one that I want to focus on is basically what saves time. So we also looked at like how efficient you can be in your probability of catching an individual fish or how likely you are to remove 100% of the density on the reef. But I think the time one is like a really tangible one for managers. What goes out and saves us time when we're actually in the act of removing lionfish? So some of the things that came out in this study were that the um, Things about the invader, the lionfish, actually made them more easy to catch. So things like um, larger size and higher densities made you more efficient and it saved you time. Remover experience. So the more experienced you are, the better you are at removing lionfish, especially when it comes to using a, a pole spear, which is one of the um, methods of choice. That really helped. And then time of day was a huge, huge um, uh, time saver. And so removing lionfish at dawn and dusk takes up to one minute less per fish for all experience levels. And so when you think about that, like one minute doesn't really matter that much. But if you go out to a reef and you've got 20 lionfish, if you're going out at the right time, it saves you 20 minutes. And again, for anybody who does any sort of scuba, 20 minutes underwater is a lot of time, especially if you're at depths where you have to do some sort of decompression at the top. You tend to be more efficient and you can possibly do more dives during the day if you're saving that time underwater. The other really great thing about this is understanding your remover experience and planning time of day is not something that you um, need need to know anything about the reef that you're going to in order to plan for. If you know who's going out on your boat and you can plan a time, that's everything you need to know in order to be more efficient, uh, regardless if it's a site you've been to multiple times or if it's a site you've never been to. These are things that you control for before actually even getting in the water, which is really great. So 
since density was one of the things that we found was like a really good predictor for um, whether or not you're going to be efficient on the reef, how do you figure out high densities before getting in the water and catching them? So um, part of my dissertation work was using bathymetry maps and habitat characteristics to um, predict high lion fish densities on the reef. And so this figure here on the left is just a figure from my paper showing where we have actual occurrences of lionfish and these stars versus where we predicted to have high lionfish densities. And we're currently um, working with some images from the Florida Reef Tract, which is where some of this work has taken place in order to do another densi density modeling. And the next step from that is how often do you need to go out and remove? And so we're also working on some models to figure out what um, what reefs and what habitat factors and biotic factors would lead to higher recolonization rates? Do we have to go out once a month to remove the fish or does this particular reef only need to be um, have removal efforts happen every four months? So those are really uh, good time saving things for managers and really important and a lot of things that can still be done without ever having to get in the water, which is really great. The last step for this project is to think about what types of priorities and valued resources need to be prioritized. And this will come directly from the management groups. And so the different types of groups that you're working with, depending on what they're located and what their, um, their position on restoration and conservation is, they'll have different priorities. Some could be for juvenile fish habitat, some marine protected areas, some could be for coral restoration. And so depending on what you're trying to conserve will also um, influence where you want to do your removals and how often you want to do them. So I'm going to kind of pop over to the other side of the, the continent and talk about some of the work I'm doing with European green crab. And so for the lionfish work, we were really lucky to kind of go from the ground up where we had a ton of data on removal efforts. And my original plan for the green crab work was kind of to do something similar, but through, as most people probably had um, some problems at the beginning of COVID, I started this project two months into COVID. And so I kind of had to redesign what I wanted to do and redesign how I wanted to figure out how to prioritize uh, removal sites for green crab. And so two of the ways that we're looking at this is um, I'm working with some folks at DFO and there are currently a few models um, that are out there that predict green crab on the west coast of um, North America and even more specifically in the Salish Sea. And so one of the first steps that we're doing is comparing these models. What do, where do they converge and where do they diverge? And are they predicting hotspots of green crab? Are they predicting presence absence or likelihood? But what we're finding with this is that even with these predictive models, there's still over 500 sites that are likely to have green crab in the Salish Sea alone. And so, you know, if there's only two or three people doing green crab monitoring and removing for DFO on the West Coast, 500 sites is way too many for them to get to. So how do we reduce that? So this part for me was the really uh, kind of cool challenge of this project and something that I hadn't done in a whole um, ever in any of the work I'd done was creating a survey. And so the survey that we created is a value based survey um, to understand what people who are actively concerned about managing or just interested in green crab care about. And so we wanted to figure out what types of resources people want to um, have more information about and then find out whether or not we actually have those resources. So my survey went live last week, so I don't have any results from it yet, but I can tell you a little bit about what went into the survey and the types of questions we're asking. So one of the key things that we really care about um, when thinking about green crab, we divide it into these three different categories. So economic resources, ecological resources, and cultural resources. So here's just kind of a screenshot of what the survey looks like. And again, we have all these different categories. So if we think about what kind of economic resources um, might be affected. So this could be uh, native crab species. Um, one of the big ones on the West Coast is going to be Dungeness crab. There's also bivalves. And so that includes all of our um, shellfish aquaculture industry people and um, a big one out here is also salmon, and so this could include um, the salmon aquaculture industry or it could include um, natural salmon habitat. And then we, for all of these, we kind of just leave a blank space so that people can fill in what they actually care about if it's not um, encompassed here. 
For ecological resources, um, we thought about things like just ecosystem health. So if you understand how your ecosystem works, is that something that you think that green crab could affect? So this is kind of more of a broad level question. We also mentioned things like protected areas. Do you care about parks and specifically these, res um, these MPAs that may be affected again by the presence of green crab? Um, diversity of invertebrate communities um, is another great one. And then this one more specifically goes into things like uh, salmon habitat and seagrass and eel beds, eel grass beds. The last one that we looked at were these cultural resources. And so this is one that I'm really interested in because it's a bit more arbitrary, but it's also something that I think folks think about when they think about the impacts of an invasive species. And so these can all include valued landmark, landmarks, um, cultural resources, religious or spiritual resources, and traditional resources that may be affected by the presence of an invader that inherently kind of ties in with whether or not it's changing that ecological system that you care about. The other questions that we asked were a little bit more concrete. Um, you know, is there a management plan for a green crab in your area? A big one. So some people may or may not know there could be a very extensive management plan. We want to know what's happening. Um, what type of staff and funding do you have for this? If you're just an interested person who goes and does beachcombing, you may not have any of this information, but you still have things that you value and you care about. And those are important for informing um, DFO for to make decisions on what types of data they want to collect. And then the one that another one that I'm really interested in is what's the best way to share the information about new green crab um, information? So do we have better um, and more effective removal processes? Do we have all these new data that we can share? Is creating a peer reviewed publication the best way to share with all of our stakeholders? Probably not. Um, would they prefer a presentation? Would they prefer some sort of white paper? So I'm really excited kind of in the um, like realm of open science and data sharing to feel to understand what types of information are going to be the most valuable to people when they um, hear about new green crab information and new resources. So kind of the whole to to wrap this up kind of going from the other way kind of opposite of what we did for the lionfish. We know we have green crab in these certain areas too many sites for us to for us to think about. So you can kind of overlay that with that valued resource. This is just kind of a screenshot of um, shellfish, shellfish fishery closures. Find out where these two overlap. So we've got this even more succinct area here. And then this is where we can target our um, removals. Even if there are green crab in all these places, this is the place where people care about resources the most. And that gives us a better target rather than saying we're just going to randomly pick spots everywhere. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the conversations we have around this is understanding that as um, academics and governmental agencies, our job is to um, kind of serve the people. And so if we're not um, focusing our removals towards areas where they have resources that they care about. We're really failing as um, researchers and doing and managers and doing what um, the public want us to do. So um, here's just kind of a, a short thank you to some of the folks that I'm working with on this green crab project. It's really cool because because it's both, um, even though I'm focused mostly on the Canadian side of the Salish Sea, there are a lot of folks on the Washington side who have been really valuable and put a lot of input into this. And it's been really great to have uh, their, um, have both sides of uh, both countries working on this. So the last thing that I just wanted to talk about really quickly was just some of the kind of non-academic work that I do. Um, and more in kind of the equity, diversity and inclusion realm. And so a few of the things, this is just some screenshots of um, some things that I'm involved with. First is the uh, Black Women, Ecology, Evolution and Marine Science. And so this group was formed basically um, in June of 2020 when a lot of things were going on in the US. Um, from a tweet. So Nikki Trailer Knowles out of University of Miami basically said, hey, I'm the only black person in my department who does marine science. Who else is out there? I need to have black women in my field. And what she sent out a Google spreadsheet, people signed up, we started having Zooms, and now we're basically this really great uh, nonprofit organization that is, um, we're getting funding to do things like webinars, to do um, workshops and uh, panels 
really directed towards black women in marine science, which is just really wonderful because one, I get on a Zoom and I can see 30 different faces of black women who are doing really, really similar things to that I'm doing in ecology, evolution, all this really fun stuff. And it gives us a sense of not being alone in our departments or in our field, which is really, really, um, really, really important, especially in this kind of time of like virtual meetings. Um, it's really easy to feel isolated. And so this has been a really great thing. The other thing that we've really tried to um, encompass with this is getting funding to do a lot of mentorship and development for early career scientists. And so we've got mentorship pro uh, a mentorship program going on that um, pairs undergrads, graduate students with um, people in their field, specifically a few, um, a few career stages above them. And I think that's really great for these young budding scientists. If I had had a black woman when I was an undergrad that I was in my field, it would have been amazing to be able to chat with her um, and then in addition to that we we've gotten funding to get some really cool people to come in and just share their experiences and share their skills which is really really great another group that i participated in and this was kind of also born out of need was this group we started at oregon state university as a graduate student called ethnic minorities united and stem and so that was another kind of unique experience where um, i think i could go like three weeks without seeing another person of color just on my floor in the department and um, i got an email one day from another another woman in the department was like hey I'm brown, you're brown, do you want to go have lunch? And we just started having lunch and talking about what it was like being the only person in our lab or the only person on the floor who was a racial minority in a science field. And that basically grew into um, an actual club on campus geared towards graduate students. But again, we really, really wanted to bridge um, the gap between undergrads and grad students and grad students in that next level. So again, one of the things that we really focused on was creating this kind of mentorship um, component where we could reach out to faculty when we could find them, have them come in, um, have lunch with us, talk about their experience at Oregon and how they got there. And then also just working with some of the undergrad groups on campus and saying, hey, we are some of the only um, people of color in these fields. If your undergrads need mentors, we will try and place them in our labs. And so that was a really fun experience. And that um, that was a cool thing to see. It, I didn't see it to fruition, but I, I have my friends, they say, we finally got we finally got started as a club. So here we are, thanks to your work. It was really fun. And then one of the last things that I did is kind of like, instead of more of the, the um, community building side, is I was able to work on this paper with a few colleagues here at the University of Alberta, um, trying to understand how you can set forth concrete action items for labs, universities, um, PIs, just faculties to reduce their discrimination and bias. And these, um, these go into things like hiring practices, how to hold a lab meeting, how to um, create a diversity statement for your um, your lab web page, things like that. So just really actionable items that um, make a big difference for underrepresented um, individuals in the STEM field. And so that was a really fun thing to do. Really, really great to work with some colleagues who are in the chemistry department here, but um, it was a great project to be on and just really cool actionable items that um, I find really easy to understand. And I can maybe share the link to the paper after I'm done with this. But um, that's basically all I have. So lots of time for questions. Here's um, a little bit of my contact information. If you'd like to email me, find me on Twitter or check out my website. And these are some of the um, links to the BWEAMS organization, um, the Black Scientists of Canada, which um, Amelie, you talked about, is kind of helping to set up this um, speaker series and then just to um, the green or change lab here at University of Alberta where I work. So with that, that's all I have for slides and I would love to take questions if there are any.